one minute to the next presentation if you'll turn your cell phones to silence. Good morning, everybody. I'm Chris Schott from J.P. Morgan, and very ho- happy to be hosting Malincroft this morning. Uh, we're going to break and do a, a fireside chat type of format, uh, but from the company, we have Mark Trudeau, the company's CEO, uh, Steve Romano, who runs R&D, as well as Brian Reasons, uh, the company's CFO. Uh, we're going to have Mark make some opening comments, and we'll just jump right into the, the fireside from that. Uh, and then, as a reminder, we're going to be down the hall in the uh, Sussex room, I believe, for the uh, breakup. So with that, turn it over to Mark. <laughs> Thanks, Chris, and uh, welcome everyone this morning. It's great to be here at the conference again this year. Uh, I'm going to start my opening comments by uh, covering our forward-looking statement disclosure. Uh, It's here in the first two slides. Uh, Just a couple of comments here. Uh, Throughout the day, you're going to hear us making some forward-looking statements, likely. Uh, Recognize that our actual results could be different from our stated expectations. We also assume no obligation to update these forward-looking statements even if something does change materially, and I would encourage you to refer to our publicly filed SEC uh, documents uh, for any more information or go to our website for this statement. Uh, As we mentioned, uh, I'm going to do a few opening remarks and we'll uh, move into a a fireside chat format. I wanted to do this uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, One, clearly uh, from a 2019 perspective and as we move into 2020, uh, we have some uncertainties that we're addressing in our business and wanted to address those up front. Uh, and then we want to spend a little p- time talking about the underlying performance of the business, which is actually quite strong, and then give some perspective on what we see as being the important objectives for the company moving forward in 2020. So I think it's pretty clear that uh, we have three uh, uncertainties uh, facing the business currently. We've been Uh, uh, actively addressing these uncertainties throughout the course of 2019. The first two I would characterize as business as usual. In the normal uh, course of operations for any company, these would be uncertainties that the company would be dealing with. Um, And this is the currently unresolved matter with CMS regarding the base state pricing um, for, uh, for Medicaid with CMS. I think, as you all know, Uh, We've been engaged in a dispute with the government around what's the appropriate pricing date for ACTHAR in Medicaid. Uh, We did have a hearing in 2019. Uh, The judge has not yet ruled on that. Uh, That ruling could come at any time um, or it it could uh, take uh, quite a while. It's really impossible to predict at this point. And again, uh, that particular uncertainty we would expect is going to be resolved at some point during the course of 2020. Fundamentally, um, while we have a range of, um, uh, of options to deal with whatever range of outcomes may come from that hearing, it doesn't fundamentally change the strategy for ACTHAR going forward, but clearly having more clarity on that issue uh, would be helpful in resolving that particular uncertainty. The second one is that we do have some near-term debt maturities. In particular, we have slightly over $600 million in debt maturities coming due uh, in April of 2020. And again, we have a range of options to deal with those maturities. And again, as I would say, uh, if we were in normal course of operations, we would be dealing uh, with that just as a normal course of business. But the third uncertainty is the one that's really provided a significant overhang to our business. uh, And it's a very complex one. That's, of course, opioid litigation. Uh, We've been in the midst of this opioid litigation amongst a whole range of other defendants uh, for quite some time. And uh, we were very encouraged uh, in the uh, latter part of 2019 to settle the track one cases in the MDL uh, with two counties in Ohio. And we were very clear at that time that our intent was to settle those cases uh, so that we could uh, negotiate with the plaintiffs to uh, hopefully uh, find a global solution with finality to this opioid litigation. Uh, Since that time, we have opened up a dialogue. Uh, We continue to negotiate with uh, with the plaintiffs. Uh, We're hopeful that, in fact, a resolution can be reached uh, sooner than later. However, as you might imagine, it's a very complex negotiation. It involves a whole range of, of plaintiffs with different objectives, and just the sheer volume, nature, and complexity of the case 
creates a fair bit of uncertainty. Again, we have to consider a range of options. Our primary option would be uh, to look to come to come to some type of a resolution, uh, but that resolution needs to address not only uh, the issues uh, in arrears, but uh, being able to operate the the business on a go-forward basis is, is pretty important. Fundamental issue here, of course, is um, all around uh, the fact that uh, uh, defendants have been involved in, in providing medically necessary drugs uh, for um, you know, a variety of different patients in, in different, um, different communities. We believe that this, is, this business that we've been operating for decades is a very good business. It provides medically necessary products uh, and we believe there is an opportunity to operate this business going forward, provided that we can come to a global resolution and a final resolution uh, to the opioid litigation. Uh, again, it, uh, we would hope to be able to resolve that sooner than later, and we're actively looking to do that. So despite all of this uh, uncertainty that's, uh, that's going on, um, the business continues to operate. The business continues to operate very well, and our overall objective for the business is to become a pure play branded pharmaceutical, biopharmaceutical growth company focused on drug development and commercialization for underserved patients with severe and critical conditions in two primary areas. One is immune mediated diseases, and the second is in the hospital critical care space. And we've set up, we think, a very exciting business to be able to deliver on that promise. And again, um, managing through these uncertainties in the near term uh, is quite important uh, for us to be able to enable that strategy going forward. A couple of things that we should look at. In 2019, we outlined four uh, broad goals for the business. We've been able to execute, execute very well on three of those goals. The fourth goal, which is uh, separating the branded business and the generics business, obviously the opioid litigation uh, has, has, has blocked that opportunity in 2019. Uh, we've explored a whole range uh, of opportunities to separate these two very different, very good businesses, but very different businesses. And again, given uh, our objective to resolve the opioid litigation, we would look forward uh, to being able to operate uh, and get these businesses operating independently, hopefully sooner than later in 2020, but of course there are complexities around that. And we have a range of options that we continue to consider to affect that particular objective. The other three objectives, one was maximizing the value of the inline portfolio, and in fact, uh, the business has continued to perform very well in 2019. Throughout the course of the year, we uh, updated uh, and uh, uh, increased guidance on the bottom line, three out of three quarters. The business continues to perform very well, generating very, very good cash flow. We also talked about advancing our pipeline and our data generation activities. 2019 was a very big year for Mallinckrodt in doing that. It started really off in, in January with some data that we uh, communicated around our Theracose platform uh, in pediatric patients with acute graft versus host disease. Uh, we reported on two late-stage development assets uh, in Terlopressin and Stratigraph, where we had very positive data in both of those programs, and we're moving rapidly towards a filing for both of those two. We're expecting that we may have the opportunity to launch those two new products uh, into our existing commercial infrastructure sometime in the second half of 2020. And again, we've had some very strong data readouts uh, around Acthar, in particular we had some very positive news on Acthar and refractory RA patients that we've been um, communicating to prescribers and payers. And we think that data uh, may enable us to think quite differently about the value proposition for Acthar going forward. And we're exploring a range of opportunities, including some subscription modeling uh, for the Acthar business, often the very good experience with that type of a commercial model that we've had with Inamex. Uh, and we're expecting in 2020 that we may have an opportunity to engage with payers in a very different way than we have historically, with the objective being able to have better, easier access for those highly refractory patients that can benefit from ACTHAR through that type of a commercial model. The last objective was to um, exercise a very disciplined capital allocation uh, uh, program with emphasis on net debt reduction. 
Uh, we reduced uh, our debt by over a billion dollars in 2019, including a very successful uh, debt exchange, uh, which netted us almost $400 million uh, in, in uh, net debt reductions. Uh, and uh, that particular exchange occurred uh, in the fourth quarter. So again, it's been a very successful operational year for the business. Of course, all of that's been overshadowed by the opioid litigation. Just to conclude, if I was to share a few goals then for, um, for 2020, obviously resolving the uncertainties facing the company are, are first and foremost, and I've talked about our pathway to do that. Um, we want to continue to maximize our diversified portfolio, stabilizing our key products, in particular Axar, um, but also uh, looking to continue the very good growth that we have in our hospital portfolio, which has been tracking to high single-digit growth throughout 2019, and continue to advance data generation and prepare for two new product launches in Stratagraft and Turtle Press in, in the second half of 2020. And of course, we'll be addressing uh, our capital structure, uh, looking at how we can continue to delever the company going forward, all the while while we deal with these uh, near-term uncertainties facing the business. So um, these are the things that are most important to the company. Clearly, we've got our priorities, I think, uh, in the right order. Uh, and we look forward to discussing it further with you and entertaining your questions. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, thanks for those uh, remarks. That kind of sets things up nicely. Uh, maybe just touching on some of those points of, of controversy. Um, first, touching on, on opioids. Uh, I think you touched on this in some of the prepared remarks, but can you just talk a little bit about in terms of where negotiations are at this point? I don't think we get the you know the day-to-day -day updates obviously in the situation, but relative to, to 3Q, have you has there been progress made as you can think about the different structures you could consider or the various parties getting to the table to to get some sort of settlement in place? Yeah, we've, uh, we've continued to negotiate with the uh, appropriate parties, we believe. Um, obviously, there are a number of different plaintiffs involved in this, and you, know, you can't come to uh, any kind of productive discussions if you've got to negotiate with you know, dozens, of, of defend or dozens of plaintiffs at the same time. So we, we have a, a core group of, uh, of uh, plaintiffs that we've been working with. Uh, we've been in active negotiations and discussions with them since we settled the um, the track one cases, uh, those discussions and, and negotiations continue, and there has been progress. And, and is the goal to get kind of a global settlement agreement, or could we see a path where we have, for instance, the state AGs separated out from some of the counties moving forward? Well, it's quite clear for us uh, we're looking for a global settlement. Um, I mean, it, uh, it makes sense for us to deal with um, the entirety of, of this litigation both looking backward and looking forward. Again, we think this is a very, very good business, providing really uh, medically necessary products. Uh, this generics portfolio, as you saw in 2019, uh, has exhibited uh, a return to growth for three consecutive quarters after an extended period of contraction. <clears throat> and again, we think going forward, this is a business that can grow. There's a, there's a pipeline in development there. Uh, largely in non-controlled, uh, hard-to-make generics, and it's a good cash flow generating mm -hmm. business. So it's, a, it's quite a healthy business, provided that it can operate in an environment where opioid litigation has been resolved, both from a backward-looking and a forward-looking uh, perspective. And that's a bit of the complexity. Uh, not only do you have a, a whole range of, of different plaintiffs to deal with with different objectives, but also you want to make sure that you've got finality uh, and completeness so that the business can operate in a productive way going forward. It makes sense. Uh, in the past, you <coughs> talked about a legal structure that could potentially shield that branded business from some of the opioid liabilities and settlements. It sounds like you think that's still a potential of separating out the, the, the specialty kind of generics business. Just talk a little bit about you know, what options are available and, and how would that impact your ability to, to get a settlement done? Yes, yeah, so I'm going to ask Brian to comment on this in just a minute, but um, you know, we, we believe that uh, our legal entity, entity structure uh, does offer at least a, an opportunity for us to come to some type of a low, uh, global resolution of this, but specific to Malincrop. We're not in any way saying that we can solve this issue for all of the defendants and all the plaintiffs, but we think we've got some special circumstances around the, the separate nature of our branded and our generics business that could enable, enable us to come to a global resolution. Yeah, and we talked about it in the back of ways when we were planning the spend. Sure. Um, and, and 
uh, if you look at kind of the history of the legal structure, uh, Mellencrot's branded business and generic business had always been had been in separate legal entities, and mm -hmm. there's not as much intertwining. So, um, just like we we're going to be able to separate it pretty easily in a spin, um, in the context of a, a settlement that could also be separated as well. Okay. And as you can appreciate, I mean, given the complexity of this, we we have to con continue to consider a, a range of, of options to, to resolve this. And again, major objective here is to resolve this globally with finality one way or another. Maybe last question on the opioid side. Just the upcoming New York case, is that a catalyst at all to get different players to the table and get something done? I, I think it, it, it can be. I mean, um, you know, for, for Mellencrot, uh, you know, it's, it's really not realistic that we start going through and settling these one-offs. Sure. It, it just doesn't – financially, we can't do it. Um, New York's a large state, um, so clearly that could be a catalyst for us. Okay. Um, maybe pivoting over to, to Akthar. Uh, just following on everything that's kind of happened between the CMS disputes and the data readouts, help us a little bit how you're thinking about the trajectory of, of that product over the next several years. Yeah, so our, our objective for Akthar is to really create a very modernized brand uh, that focuses specifically on uh, refractory patients uh, in some very challenging disease conditions. And the example would be the RA um, in, uh, data that we just generated. Um, we're not necessarily looking to have this product be, um, you know, a, a, an early line product to address uh, typical RA patients. We're looking for those highly refractory RA patients <coughs> who, after being on a, a lot of other products, still have active disease. And I think the RA data that we presented was specifically in that patient type, and we were able to demonstrate that uh, with the appropriate dose and duration, those patients can have significant benefit. In fact, we saw somewhere around 65% or so of these highly refractory RA patients experiencing benefit by being dosed on Akthar uh, with a specific regimen for at least 90 days. That data is very powerful, and we've got a whole number of additional data sets that will be coming out uh, in the next 12 months or so. <coughs> in addition to that, we're looking at a, a modernized presentation effectively a pre-filled syringe uh, self-injector uh, that would be a unit dose. And, and that uh, could enable us to think very differently about the commercial model for Akthar. Effectively, the current multi-dose vial that we have for Akthar really is required only for the infantile spasms indication. All of the other uh, primary adult indications could be more uh, easily and more effectively addressed with the pre-filled syringe um, self-injector. And so by continuing to develop innovation, creating more data uh, around ACTAR, we think that is really the key uh, to, to uh, uh, generating access uh, and ensuring growth over the long term. We'll know what we have with ACTAR uh, within the next 12 months or so as these things play out. Obviously, we're quite encouraged um, by the success of the, of the ACTAR RA data. In addition to that, we've been generating a lot of preclinical data, which, is exact, which has uh, resulted uh, in some changes to the label, which are very meaningful, distinguishing Akthar from ACTH and, and uh, corticosteroids. So this, this brand now is starting to become, I think, uh, a much more modern, modern brand than it was before, which is to the benefits of the patients, um, uh, the refractory patients, and, and the healthcare system. And the final piece is, uh, this subscription model, which we've had very good success with with Inamex, uh, could resonate quite well with payers. We've, we're, we've been in active discussions with a number of payers. They like the concept uh, because it enables them to identify the specific patients, uh, again, armed with the data, and that helps our business because uh, we would be contracting effectively um, with, with payers to have better access, easier access for those specific patients uh, you know, that, that would be addressed by the subscription model. Long term, we would expect that if we continue to have good positive data readouts, our modernization activities continue, uh, that ACTHAR uh, can continue to grow uh, over the long term. Great. Um, maybe just pivoting a little bit, uh, you had, had a couple nice pipeline readouts last year with, with Turlopressin and Stratograft. Uh, maybe a question for, for Steve, if you could just 
lay out kind of the next steps for those products and sure. should we be thinking about ad comms, et cetera, as, as these go through the regulatory process? Yeah, so as Mark said, we did have a very successful year. Two of our phase three programs that we had initiated several years ago read out. One, Stratagraft, which is uh, going to be a BLA. This is a regenerative medicine product uh, for uh, replacement of autografting in certain patients with severe burns. The first indication is in deep partial thickness burns. So we've completed that study. The results were really very clear and good. We had very good meetings with the agency, a pre-BLA meeting back in November, and we are moving towards filing in the first quarter. So we're cleaning, we're mm -hmm. in the process of doing that. Uh, we would hope that we will get a, a priority review. So after two months of an initial review by the agency and acceptance of the filing, we should have it approved sometime in the third or fourth quarter of the year with an ability to launch in the last uh, portion of the year. So we don't, we don't know about an advisory committee, whether that will be necessary yet. We do have an RMAT uh, designation, which is a regenerative medicine advanced therapy designation for this product. We were one of the first uh, products to get that designation. That does afford you some uh, greater sort of acceleration of your processing with, with the agency. So perhaps we will not, but I, I can't confirm that yet. Uh, with terlipressin, this is our vasopressin analog being uh, developed for HRS type 1, which is a type of renal failure associated in patients with cirrhosis. Uh, very critical condition if you don't reverse. So very substantial condition, first-line therapy for patients with this condition around the world, not yet available in the U.S. So in the same way as uh, Stratigraph, in parallel, we're actually preparing that filing as well. We would hope to have that file actually uh, in, in, again in the first quarter, probably as early as uh, February, so looking, uh, looking forward to that. That is a response to a CRL that the previous sponsor had gotten based on the negative results of a, a previous study. So that has a six months time clock. Mm -hmm. We do anticipate an advisory committee, okay. and that would probably happen in the fourth or fifth month of the six month review. Mm -hmm. So we've had discussions with the agency in our pre-NDA uh, finally meeting, and we uh, feel well prepared to move forward with that. Both of these products would uh, slot right into our existing commercial infrastructure in the hospital. Uh, uh, we have a, a, a very experienced hospital team that's currently selling Affirmav, Theracos, Inamax, uh, and these two products would slot right into uh, the, the team that's effectively selling <coughs> Affirmav today. Great. And just in our last maybe a minute or two here, uh, 2020 maturities, can you just talk a little bit about how you're planning to address some of that? Uh, debt coming due. Yeah, and there's a you know there's a lot of moving parts. Mm -hmm. So um, obviously we had, you saw uh, the third quarter results where we continue to generate a lot of cash flow. Um, yeah, sorry. So we continue to generate a lot of cash flow, and and are mindful of that. Um, you saw the exchange. We we would have it was successful. We would have liked to have had more of the 2020s exchanged, yep. um, but we we still have uh, access to secure capacity um, as well. So we we feel like um, you know given where the current opioid negotiations are and with CMS out, outstanding, um, you know, we, we still have enough flexibility to take care of the 2020s. Great, great. Well, I think we're just about out of time. We'll uh, continue the discussion uh, down the hall in the uh, Sussex room. Thanks, thank you. Good, thank you.